When I first decided I wanted to be an architect, I was very lucky. I, that decision was made when I was 13. At 13, I knew exactly um, what I wanted to be in life. I'm an old boy at Peckham School for Girls, which always caused great hilarity among my daughters. And I would point out and say, that's my old school. The headmistress of that school was a ferocious uh, Irish lady called Miss O'Reilly, but very, very sensible. And of course, she put me in for the technical scholarship, which is a thing that you then did when you were 12. And I passed that. And so my mother and I were uh, were interviewed by what, 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 what did I want to do? And of course I said, I want to design aeroplanes, Spitfires. Oh, she said, we'll put you down for the engineering school at Lewisham. She said, but you must have a second choice. Second choice. So I said, well, I haven't got a second choice. She said, well, we'll put you down for building. What I didn't know was even in February 1942, that, that's when it was, um, the government, even then, were thinking about post-war reconstruction. There'd be a lot of engineers, but construction building wouldn't be, be, be the important thing. And so, of course, in April 1942, I found myself at the School of Building Brixton on a junior, three-year junior course, age 13. And within three months of being at the School of Building, I was still mad on aeroplanes. I still loved the Spitfire, but I was going to be an architect. For the first year, you had literally one day a week in workshops, so you lay bricks, plastered walls, um, made lead joints, and chipped away at masonry. And that is most important, because architecture is, uh, is a practical art. Yes, it's creative, and you're creating something you hope that is beautiful and will be admired, but it's got to work. So I got a job in a, an architect's office. Uh, I was only 16. Rego Closiers, a big factory in Tottenham, had been burnt down, and they got a license, a building license, to rebuild it. Uh, in 1945, before the war even finished. And of course, I was given the job of doing all the drawings. Boy, did I learn fast. I started uh, in, at Westminster, well, the, it was the Regent Street Polytechnic in those days, now it's Westminster University. I started at their evening school of architecture where you went three evenings a week, did one year, uh, and then I was called up. I then had well, two year break, 20 months in the army. But when I came out, the RIBA had special concessions for uh, returning servicemen who'd fought for king and country. And they applied to me as well because I was under the conscription. So I didn't have to do all the painful testimonies of study. So I sat uh, in the RIBA building in the Florence Hall. I sat the intermediate exam externally at the end of the second year and passed. So, of course, I went to the head of uh, uh, Regent Street Poly School of Architecture and said, aren't I a clever boy? I passed the examination at the end and said, will you put me up to the fifth year? Fifth year? And he said, no way. He said, you're here to learn architecture, not to learn how to pass examinations. There was no way. I just saved the two years that I'd lost in the army. And so I then transferred back. The Brixton School of Building had an evening school of architecture as well at the same time. So I went back to the Brixton School of Building, the evening school of architecture, and then I did the final examination externally, again in the Florence Hall here in this building. I know exactly where I sat, and I passed that in 1952. By then, I was already beginning to get work of my own. Um, uh, one or two private, sort of private jobs, very small, but that was the beginning. And so by 1954, uh, I really decided I had to sit the, what was then a professional practice uh, exam. I sat that, passed that, uh, and so in 1954 uh, I came galloping through the front doors of this building with my two, two guinea check in my grubby little hand uh, to sign on as a, a probationer, which you, you could do so. So I was then a student, RIBA, appeared in the, in, in the, in, in the members book that they used to publish. And of course then, once I passed the final exam, I again came galloping through the front doors uh, and I was elected. I wanted to be a member of the RIBA, A, because I felt very proud of the fact that I'd made it 
Um, but also, I could have those magic words behind my title, and I was already beginning to work, do private work. Um, ARIBA, associate of the RIBA, Owen Luda. I dropped the Harold, which is my first name, uh, and I just became Owen. Even before I'd qualified, I'd always quite clearly wanted to work for myself. I wanted to build up my own practice, do my own thing. In the mid-50s, I found myself king of the ladies' hairdressing salons. The interesting thing about my career is so many times I've found myself uh, designing buildings that were being were in, a, in a, a, an area that were of change, of dramatic change, and I had to be part of the process of, of changing the whole approach to design. And of course, ladies' hairdressing salon in salons in the mid-1950s uh, were Mr. Teasy Wheezy, Vidal Sassoon was just beginning to make a name for himself, but the whole pattern of hairdressing was changing from ladies um, in nasty smelling things on their head, hiding behind uh, curtains in cubicles, a very secretive affair that men, of course, were banished from. You didn't go into a ladies' hairdressing salon. And, of course, I then started designing ladies' hairdressing salons as interior design. And I designed Vidal Sassoon's first big salon in Bond Street. But, unfortunately, we didn't get the job. And uh, his contractor effectively built my design. Today, I would have sued him for breach of copyright, but in those days, get on, move on. As we got to the back end of the 1950s, I got in, started getting involved in commercial development. Architects were too posh, too aloof, too professional. They didn't want to get involved with developers. I was introduced to Alec Coleman, and from then on, of course, the relationship I had with him, we built a whole millions of pounds worth of work, developments which were epoch-making, where they were iconic buildings. When I was introduced to Alec Coleman, uh, the first thing he got me to do, he phoned me a few days later and said, Owen, will you go to Leicester? I've got a site offered to me in Leicester uh, for offices on the ring road. Will you go and have a look, tell me what I can do with it? And so I went and had a look at it, came back and said, Alec, or Mr. Coleman, I wasn't on the Alec terms in those days, Mr. Coleman, I said, I can get you 100,000 square feet on that site. It's a great site, it's right on the ring road. But who's going to take 100,000 square feet of offices in Leicester? The only person that has built, has built 30,000 square feet, which he left to the government. And Alec Coleman said to me, Owen, he said, you're the first architect that's ever told me not to build something. From that moment on, the relationship I had with Alec Coleman was absolutely, really quite magical. I was interviewed by the Architects Journal, and they said to me, Owen, you've lived and practiced during pretty well every boom and bust since the war, and you seem to have survived and prospered. How do you do it? So I said, well, do you want an article, or do you want two words, three words, two, three words? And they said, well, we need the article, what are three words? I said, keep ahead of the game. I said, you have got to anticipate what is happening, what the trends are, what the pressures are for change, and then, design according to change. And that's what happened um, with, certainly with the, well, happened with that ladies' hairdressing salon, but it also happened with, um, for example, shopping centres. My view was that a shopping centre was like a fairground. All the individual shopkeepers got to shout their wares. That was what it was on. That's the success of it. That's the success of a market. And so I'd said, no, whatever the shopkeepers want to do in their shop fronts, they can do it. No control at all but within this very, very strong framework of the concrete main structure. The interesting thing was that uh, a guy that wrote New Buildings of Britain in 1967, uh, he illustrated Tricorn and also Gateshead, and Eros House Catford, which is the one I got the RIVA bronze medal for, which really put me on the map as an architect. And he said that the great success of Owen Luder is that he combines this plasticity in the use of design and concrete which at times is quite mannerist, in other words, it's a bit forced, but combines it with an instinctive understanding of how commercial development works. When you start a project, when you're first appointed, or you first start designing it, even maybe before you're appointed, you have a sheet of blank sheet of white paper. And the only thing you have is, an arch is a client's brief. In the case of those shopping centres, I didn't have a client's brief. I wrote the brief myself.
Brutalist was used as a derogative word. In the end, concrete was used as a derogative word. I mean, I did a shopping centre in Bath, which didn't have any concrete inside anywhere. It's all Bath stone. A mo very modern design, admittedly, but nevertheless. And it was still called a concrete monstrosity. The BBC or newspapers would have, comp you know, straw polls with their readers or their viewers as to what is the most ugliest building, and Tricor would always be on the list. The BBC did a programme called Demolition, and so they did film pieces on each of six buildings. I did the one with Kevin MacLeod in Gateshead. The woman producer said to me, he said, Owen, ask Kevin what he thinks. And you can see the piece of television film. Kevin looked up at the building and said, of all of these six, this is the one that should be kept. I built up a team of young architects, all thinking as I did. I never had to advertise to staff. These young architects would come and say, can we come and work for you, Mr. Luda? Please, um, you know, because you're building that team up. So you had a team. And of course, all big building, big developments are teamwork. I mean, you, you may be at the top and you may determine the policy and you may, determine, you may do the conceptual design, but in the end, if it's a big scheme, other people are involved, it's a teamwork. When the commercial development uh, market uh, collapsed, with the economy started collapsing uh, in the back end of, well, the second half of the 1960s, it's when I then moved out of, quite deliberately, uh, changed my emphasis away from commercial development into other buildings and started designing a lot of public sector buildings. From then on, of course, we did a whole string of high security prisons. We did um, the Durham one. We did Full Sutton in York. Um, and then, of course, having done the, the, uh, the Durham prison, interesting, the PSA phoned me and said, I mean, we've got a prison, we've got to build a prison very, very quickly over, over the water. And the moment they said over the water, I knew exactly where they meant in Northern Ireland. And so they said, but it, it's very straightforward. We'd like you to do it. Uh, all you have to do is use the, the, um, uh, use the plans for the Durham prison. But of course, what they'd overlooked was not only with all the levels all over the place, the orientation was different. I mean, and in the end, we really redesigned it. And the prison design was, I couldn't influence it. They were, we were just, it was just a case of getting them built. Having said that, Franklin Prison in Durham has got a lovely piece of brick sculpture outside. And one of my friends, because it was always coming up on, on television because it was, where I have a high security wing in a Category B prison. High and the high security ring, ring of course, had all the, 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 the RAO terrorists. And uh, of course, they were always concerned about them. And so uh, they, I said, how did you manage to persuade them to, to spend that money on that brick sculpture outside the main entrance? I said, it isn't a brick sculpture, it's an anti-tank trap. Uh, 1975, the economy collapsed in a big way very big way. Secondary banks were going bust, developers were going bust. The workload here was, um, in this country, in the UK, uh, was getting very, very difficult. I was very fortunate. I got the high security prisons, which was providing fee income, and I also have been appointed for the Vale of Beaver coal mining, which is suddenly getting involved in pushing out the frontiers of coal mines, not, not underground, but on all the surface. Uh, but I just sensed that the opportunity was abroad. We'd had the oil price explosion. Suddenly the Middle East was awash with money and things. And so I decided that uh, I would go abroad. We did a lot of work in Saudi Arabia. We did the city hall in Taif, which is the summer capital in the late summer. Uh, we did the Ministry of Agricultural Building in, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. But Saudi Arabia was very successful. Nigeria, we did the National Stadium. The other one was Iran. I had a very good friend called Paris, Paris Moedi, who was Iranian, but had worked over here for years. And I met him and we worked together. He'd worked for me, I'd worked for him. And he had very big connections. This is in the days of the Shah. He had very big connections in Iran. And, uh, and he said, well, if you're going to over there, I'll, I'll take you over and give you the introductions. And so he flew me over there, and sure enough, uh, and I sent one of my guys out there to open an, an office. Um, but Iran, even under the Shah, you knew if you picked the phone up, somebody was listening at the other end. So, so we used to do all sorts of strange uh, messages, you know, just to confuse them. Also, he, he did, in fact, uh, Paris, 
said, my uncle, his uncle, he said, is, is, uh, is chief of the Iran police. What he didn't tell me was he was also deputy chief of the Sarvak, the secret police. And he was a general. And, and Paris said to me, he said, you know, you're doing high security prisons. He said, they got a program for high security prisons in, in Iran. He said, um, uh, he said you, you know, the, the, you, you really ought to get in on it. He said, meet my, my uncle. So his uncle came over, quite a small man, and we had dinner uh, with him in an Iranian restaurant in Kensington with Paris and very, very pleasant. And he was over here because his daughter was over here having medical treatment. And he said to me at the end of it, he said, oh, and he said, you must come and see me. Uh, next time you're in Tehran, come and see me. We're talking about high security prisons. And he gave me his card and he said, uh, the address is the Ivan, Ivan prison. He said, the, the taxi driver will be very nervous. He said, he'll only drop you at the front door. And so I thought, yeah, okay. So I, I, next time, I, I brought my next trip to, around Ford a bit, and I went out there. And the taxi driver dropped me outside the, 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 the front entrance of the Ivan prison, and I was ushered in, the doors clanged behind me, and I walked through, and then I found, I was taken to his office. Uh, he was quite a little man, but he was sitting on a podium behind his desk, with big epaulets and a, and we chatted like anything, um, you know, for one. Then he said, well, okay, he said, the first one, he said, uh, I mean, we, uh, said, we will appoint you for one. He said, we've got one coming up. He said, um, uh, we'll have to talk about it. And I said to him, by then I was thinking, do I want to design high security prisons in Iran? And so I said to him, I'll have to get government clearance because we, you signed the Official Secrets Act where you design prisons. And I said, I'll have to get my government clearance and I can do it because of the Official Secrets Act. Knowing full well, I didn't actually have to. And as I walked out and those doors clanged behind me, I thought, no, I don't think I want to <laughs> One of the most interesting overseas things was Little Rock, Arkansas. And I met some very influential people in, uh, in, in Arkansas, the Baileys, and they wanted me to go out and help them. So I, in fact, went to Little Rock, Arkansas, and I advised them on their uh, redevelopment of downtown Little Rock. Uh, I did advise them to keep the railway station because there was the railway station, the, the Rock Island line, uh, all empty. And to me, I could see all the big American uh, uh, steam engines there. Uh, and I said, you must keep it, but they didn't. But the interesting thing was, of course, one, they made me uh, a freeman of the state of Arkansas. So I'm a freeman of the city of London and a freeman of the state of Arkansas. Um, but also, uh, as I was leaving, he said, oh, they're going to fly a flag over the Capitol in Washington today in your honor. And he said, they will send it to you. Sure enough, two or three weeks later, the flag arrived with the certificate signed and it had been flown over Washington. In 1965, I think, I made my approach to the RBA and said, look, I'd like to get involved, you know, put me on a committee. I wanted to go on the Public Affairs Committee because public relations, uh, media, that, I, I reckon I knew a bit about that, even, even at that stage. By then, of course, I was also beginning to shout my head off and say, look, hang on, uh, the way education is being run, the way particularly practice, it's out of date. We're, we're still operating as though we're Victorian professionals, and we're not. It's a different world. So, of course, I began to get a name. I'd already got a name architecturally, which helped enormously, but I began to get a name for arguing um, about uh, change, the, RIB, the way the profession should change running itself. Anyway, I stood for Council 67 and got on. And, of course, I was then the, the troublemaker, the backbencher, the one shouting the odds, and. I didn't get anywhere. I mean, I was not considered to be part of the thing. I was, I, was an, I was one of the awkward squad. There weren't many of them in those days. I'd never had any aspiration to be president until Gordon Graham refused to have me as his uh, uh, vice president when he was his second year as, as president. And that's when I decided, told this, I would stand for president. I mean, I just went on a publicity campaign, meeting members in, in regional meetings and in publicity. And of course, in the end, I, um, I won with more than 56% of the votes. Ian Leslie, who was the editor of Building Magazine, who was my mentor and got me writing as a columnist, he said, I was talking to, 
two architect knights, Lord Isha and uh, Freddie Gibbs, Sir Freddie Gibbard. And we were talking about the younger architects coming up who might be presidents. He said, I mentioned your name. He said, and they both said, oh no, he didn't go to the right school. <laughs> you know, I, I just broke a mold here, which, um, and of course I had a very successful first presidency. I, I, I can say that because the, the facts are, I was seen by some of the public sector architects as the real ogre to the right of Igus Khan, and I wasn't like that at all. Yes, it was, uh, I enjoyed it most of the time. The second presidency was more difficult, uh, and I must admit, on one or two occasions in the second uh, presidency, which is 13 years later, I did occasionally sit there and think, what the hell am I doing this job for? I'm not even getting paid for it. Michael Hesseltine, who I knew quite well, and he was the environment minister at the time, and he approached me, he said he wanted to do a, uh, an architect developer competition for it, and so I helped him set it up. And then I was invited to the private view of the exhibition at the National Gallery of the seven shortlisted schemes. And I should have known better, but the edit, the architectural correspondent of the Times came sidling up to me and said, Owen, what do you think about these um, shortlisted schemes? And I said, well, you know, that one, that's a state set for Romeo and Juliet. And that, 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 those are commercial development. Um, that one's quite good. But Richard Rogers is the only scheme that, are, that has sort of said, well, that's what I think the answer is. And sod it, if, you know, take it or leave it, which perfectly justified. But of course, that created a hiatus. I mean, an RIBA president using the word sod um, in those days was uh, uh, really was none. And as a result, Prince Charles became interested. And the net result was when the final scheme, which was not Richard Rogers, was B B uh, BHK, when their scheme, which was a revised scheme, when that was published, that was the one that Prince Charles, of course, calls, uh, described as the carbuncle. Uh, of course, in 1981, 82, uh, Mrs. Thatcher had, was the Prime Minister and was in the middle of a, an economic crisis. And of course, the construction industry was in a very bad way. We had a construction industry group called then, the, the Group of Eight, which was eight representatives right across the board, the whole of the industry. Uh, trade unions, con contractors, subcontractors, and of course, the professionals, which in fact, I was the, as the president of the RIBA, uh, I was accepted as the chairman of the, of the construction industry group. Michael Hesseltine arranged a meeting with the Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, Sir Geoffrey Howe. He entertained us at number 11 in uh, soft, soft seat sofas and deep pile carpets, and we got absolutely nowhere. And so I would said to Patrick Harrison, who was the secretary then at the RIBA in charge, and I said, what do we do? And he said, you should meet Mrs. Thatcher, the Prime Minister. I'd already warned the construction industry that she would, as we were trade unions on one side, uh, con the contractors on the other, that she would try to split us up. And of course, that's exactly what she did. Um, and I, she, she was attacking to the, the, the unions, trying to get us on that line. And I waited for her to take a breath. And I just said, sorry, Prime Minister, it's not like that. And there was a deathly hush. And of course, uh, uh, when I went to a reception at 10 Downing Street three or four weeks later, she wouldn't talk to me. <laughs> but I've always worked on the basis that A, I don't hold um, grudges. If something's happened in the past, that's history. And so I've always tried to be as friendly as possible. In my commercial development days, um, Alec Coleman's sidekick, side man, uh, John, Jack Houtman, uh, used to say to me, oh, and he said, you come to every meeting 10 minutes late, he said, you come in there with a grin, crack a joke, he said, and everybody's eating it out of your hand. I, I, it's just one of my, I suppose, it, you know, it's a personality, you have a personality. I don't, I don't play the personality, that's just, just me. I am always friendly, no reason, why not be friendly? Friends with everybody. Very often I've got out of difficult situations by a grin and a joke and... So, uh, whereas if you go in, you know, with your, your knuckles gripped and you're going to have a fight. You'll have a fight. I love everybody until I've discovered that the reason why I shouldn't love them or shouldn't like them. One of the things, of course, is I enjoy life and you project that enjoyment of life and that's part of the personality. But that's just me. I mean, I don't, I've never developed that. It's just me. It's the way I am, for good or bad. 
Most people, I suppose, would look at my career and say, well, for, what more could you expect? Uh, I had a great career. Um, I started with nothing, and I have considerably more than nothing now. So uh, from the point of view of professional reputation, um, somebody once said to me, after Foster and Rogers, you're probably the best known architect in the land.